speaker of tonight, uh, Temi Goulet. She is an associate professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Mississippi. Her expertise is on symbiosis in coral reefs. But beside her research, she focuses on teaching biology. Yeah, that's right. yeah. <laughs> Okay, Chris? <laughs> Still in one piece? Okay, good. Well, let me go on. Um, so beside her research on uh, um, coral reefs, uh, she teaches biology to non-biologists. She even has uh, mini labs to, so children can do genetic research on coral reefs. Let, um, well, let's hear a big applause to Tammy Boulay. And one of them is usually the winner. Either it grows over the other one, or the other one has dead tissue on the side facing the other. So space is at a premium. And so if a coral grows more, that benefits them. In addition to that, corals, the bigger the coral, the more it reproduces. So in coral, size does matter for reproduction. Because corals, each polyp, each one of those creatures living in a cup, which makes up the colony, reproduces. The more surface area there is, the more polyps there are. The more polyps there are, the more reproducing polyps there are. So if a coral grows more, it can reproduce more. So what I did here was I measured, these corals look like a ball. So I measured the height, the length, and the, and the uh, width of the ball to calculate a sphere. And I came back and measured it again. And I did it for corals with fish and without fish. And so you can argue that maybe there are corals that are without fish because there's something wrong with the coral. And so the fish are avoiding these corals. And so I also did that for corals where I started out with corals that all had fish, and then I removed the fish from half of them, and I watched what, what happened. And what I can tell you is the corals with fish grow more. And, because, and not only that, but I looked at their gonads, and so they don't reproduce less. So because they grow more, they actually reproduce more because they have more surface area. So there is a definite benefit to having these fish. And so this association, as a result of that study, was defined as a mutualism, where both partners benefit. Now, the scary part about this slide, which was taken in 1990, for those of you that either have been diving with me or will go diving tomorrow, I still have that snorkel. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness. And I actually still have my regulator, although I didn't bring it here. Um, I don't know what that says, <laughs> except that the, it's good or that I, I don't replace my gear. I, I can't fit into the suit, though, so something <laughs> has changed over time. Okay, another example, the Pedersen shrimp, which you see here in the coarse screw anemone. So for the shrimp, this is an obligate symbiosis. For the anemone, it's not. And what I wanted to show you about this is the, the fact, so for example, I showed you the coral and, and the fish, and I said it's a mutualism, but it's actually a three-way mutualism, because the coral has algae, and the fish is there. And so what does the fish do to benefit the coral? It probably moves within the coral, so that stirs up the air, so there's not a, an, um, a place where there's you know, basically lack of oxygen. It also fertilizes the coral, because it, it does its business in the coral. And so in this particular case, this was a study that was published last year from uh, the Chadwick Lab in uh, the University of Auburn, Auburn University. 
there's actually, it's more complicated than that. So in this particular case, you have an anemone. The anemone has symbionts in it. It has the symbiodinium. It has the cleaner shrimp. It's obligate for the cleaner shrimp. Now what they found was that the fish that came to be cleaned honed in on the anemone. The shrimp are very small. Have you seen? I mean, many of you have seen these shrimp. They're kind of small. They're hard to find if, unless you're looking for them. Well, the anemone was the cue for the fish to come to the station. So the shrimp benefit because they clean the parasites, the ectoparasites that are on the fish. The fish benefit because they get the parasites removed. The fish home in and know where these cleaner shrimp are because they see the anemone. The anemone benefits because it has food as a result of the, the ammonia and everything that the, fish, that the shrimp excrete. And there's also another shrimp that protects the anemones. And my point to showing you all of this is that everything is complicated and everything is tied in and everything is in a very delicate balance. And if, for example, you do not have the anemone, this whole circle collapses. And so the shrimp may not have a habitat unless they can adapt and find another anemone, which, which they live in other anemones. But if those go, then they have no habitat. And this whole multi-way symbiosis falls apart. And so it's very delicate. There was a question in the back? Yes. Uh, uh, you say that uh, it's an obligate uh, symbiotic relationship for the Peterson cleaner shrimp. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But here you see Peterson cleaner shrimp on the Mm -hmm. Yeah, I noticed. I, mm -hmm, I noticed that here. This study was done in, um, I believe it was in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and so it's interesting. So that's, for example, one thing that maybe um, it's it's different. You do you do see sometimes um, um, fish and organisms will adapt, but then the question is how do the how do the big fish cue in on them and whether there's a reduction in the visitation because they don't have the anemone. <laughs> I know they're like cleaning station right here. Yeah. So there may be a consequence. I mean, if they, if they've shown, for example, hermit crabs in areas where there's a lot of plastic pollution, that they are walking around with cups on, on them, you know, all these different things. And so, so, you know, these organisms are trying to survive, but it may be negatively affecting the amount of visitations that they're getting. But yeah, I've, I've noticed that too. Yes. Yeah, or with, um, Did. with lionfish mm -hmm. here. You know, this, this whole thing is one white sphere. Mm -hmm. The lionfish, you know, predatory, early, whatever. So, do you see a decrease in vegetation in terms of anemones and things like that because the lionfish is here killing the other fish that would normally, you know, stoke that fire? Well, there's a lot. Of, I mean, the lionfish issue has, has um, I mean, it's definitely serious. And the problem is that they're decimating the local fish population at various levels, both juveniles and, and young of, of fish. Um, it may eventually affect the circles. And so those are aspects that we do not know, I mean, which is part of what keeps me employed, of finding out what is going on and trying to figure that out. And there's been active um, efforts to remove lionfish because they do, are not part of this ecosystem. And this ecosystem cannot evolve quickly enough to deal with them. So that's one issue. That was, that was a question. Or does it go back to the 2005 coral bleaching event when, I don't know how many people are here who were diving then, whatever yeah. it was. Yeah. But <laughs> are they, did the anemones die first? And that's why those Peterson shrimp are out there on their own? Or what do you, do they know what would have been affected first or everything all at once? I, I think it's a chain reaction. I mean, so this study, what they did was they covered the anemone, so they made it invisible to the fish, and they found that the visitations were less. And so I don't, I mean, so the Peterson fish surviving is an interesting fact in itself, because I, I noticed that too. But then the other thing is, how good are they surviving? Are they surviving or are they doing great? And maybe without the anemones, they're not doing great. And so I'm, I'm going to talk in a minute about bleaching and what the consequences of that. And, and I think it's, but the, I think the main thing is it's very complicated, and just because one organism disappears doesn't mean that that's the only one affected, and you can have a chain reaction of that, and maybe that will catch up with other organisms as well. And so I'll. I'll and when you go there, can you address <coughs> what will make those anemones come back? 
Yeah. Well, we'll try. <laughs> so nothing in this universe exists alone, and that, that's part of that question. Yeah, when you talk about anemones, yes. um, are you talking about all the soft corals in general? Or just no, so anemones, anemones belong to the, the group that was the coral, with the hard corals. Okay. They're the ones that have the, the multiples of six, actually. You're okay. welcome to count, but they do have multiples of six. Octocorals are in that other group. So when you're talking about anemones, is it about uh, hard corals in general? They're, hard, they're in the same group as the hard corals. So the, you have the anemones and the hard corals in one group, yeah. and then you have the octocorals in the other group, and all of them are within the, the cnidarians. Okay, but my point is, if you, see, you can see pieces and plumage shrimps as well in the other hard corals and things like that. They're mostly in sea anemones when they do have a habitat. Okay. Um, so, the one thing that I want to address, so I'm telling you that, that corals are symbionts and, uh, have symbionts and those symbionts are obligate. How do they get those symbionts? And what is really interesting is that many corals are not born with their symbionts. And so it's kind of weird because although they have to have the symbionts in order to survive, they're not born with them. So, um, when uh, corals reproduce sexually, they can do that in two different ways. One way is a broadcast spawning, and what they do is they release eggs and sperm into the water column, and the fertilization occurs in the water column, and then the fertilized egg be, uh, develops into a larvae, and the larvae for corals is called planula. Why they added another name, and just to make your life miserable, but they are called planula. And the planula then settles on the reef and becomes the first polyp, and that polyp then acquires the symbionts. So it, it has to acquire it from the environment. There's another strategy for corals. Some corals brood their larvae, so the eggs are retained within the mother colony. The sperm fertilize the eggs within the mother colony. The mother colony brood the eggs and then releases the planula when they're planula. Many of these corals have planula that have symbionts within them. So the mother transfers the symbionts to the offspring and releases them with those symbionts. So that is uh, internal fertilization. The coral that I spoke about earlier, Stylophora pistillata, is one that broods its larvae, and those brooded larvae have the symbionts within them. These are the symbionts, they're very, very small. Um, and we've been doing experiments with them. I just wanted to show you a picture of, of how we collect them, and then to talk about another project here in the Caribbean. So we put a net over a coral, and when the planula are released, and they're released at night, they swim, and they swim up, and they get trapped through the funnel into a collection jar, and then we can collect those, those planula and we can do various experiments to see, for example, what helps them settle, what, you know, various things like that. Uh, I, this past summer, I was also involved with a collection here in the Caribbean. Do you guys recognize this coral? Elkhorn coral. And elkhorn coral releases eggs and sperm, so they, they, are, they, they fertilize in the, in the, in the water. Now, you may have heard or been involved in efforts to, uh, to help elkhorn. When you go diving, how many elkhorn coral have you seen here? We have oh, coming back. Back. Okay. We were smooth. Okay. Okay. So you see some, but they're not common. And so what people have been doing is that they, so corals are made up of these polyps, right? And so you can break off a piece of coral, and you can basically make another coral from this coral. It's, it's exactly like if you have a plant and your friend wants that plant and if it's a plant that can do that, you cut a trimming from the plant, they stick it in water, it, it forms roots and now you have two plants, right? So now you can give that to your friend. Well, so people have been taking corals and breaking them to little pieces and then reseeding the reef. The problem with that is that all those little pieces and the original coral are genetically identical. <laughs> which means there is not a lot of genetic diversity, and if there's any kind of disease or anything like that, it will decimate the population. What she is doing is she's collecting eggs and sperm. This is in Mexico. This is um, Dr. Anya Banasak. And she's collecting egg, eggs and sperm and actually making a proper of babies. And each one of them is genetically unique because it's eggs and sperm from different mothers and fathers. And she's rearing them from that stage all the way, and then they're planting those on the reef to increase the genetic diversity. And that's a unique program because most programs are fragmentation programs where you break off a piece. 
but the collection tube is the same. So, um, so that is how a coral gets their algae. Now, once they have their algae, do they keep them? Well, I mean, we know they keep them because we know they can't survive without algae, but do they keep the same ones? It's as if I were to ask you if the roommate that you had in college, is it the same roommate you have in the 20s as is the same roommate you have in the 40s? Well, I can probably tell that by looking at them, unless they change dramatically. For corals, we can't do that. We have to use molecular techniques because their roommates are indistinguishable morphologically. And so this type of question um, I was interested in addressing, and I did that in the San Blas Islands in Panama, where the Kuna Indians are. And this was through the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, although their field station is no longer uh, working because the Kuna Indians didn't want to renew their lease. Um, so I worked there, and I worked on this coral, which is a Gorgonian coral. It's a soft coral. It's an octocoral. It's known as Plexura Kuna. It's named after the Kuna Indians. And um, as you can see, it looks like a bush. And there are different environmental conditions. So there are different light levels at the top of the coral than in the middle of the coral. And there are different light flow through and on all that. And so one of the in things that I was interested in looking at, if there are different conditions. So I'm showing you a picture of a gel. First of all, to show to you that we are as cool as the people in CSI Las Vegas, New York, and Miami, which actually they show you pictures like this all the time. And then I tell my students, we do that. So this is a picture of basically we took a piece of DNA and we made copies of it. And then we cut it up with enzymes. So they cut it up. It's, and then we run it. And I think you can see that all of them have the same banding pattern, this dominant pattern. And so what it tells you is that no matter if it's the top of the bottom of a colony, whether it's 17, 14, 11, or 5 meters, they have exactly the same symbiont. Now, this is at one level of resolution. This is like saying, well, the symbionts are all from North America, as if we were talking like of humans. There's finer level of resolution. You can take the symbiont DNA, and you can take all of its genome, and you can generate a pattern for that. And that is known as a DNA fingerprint. Now, there are a lot of lines in there, but you can get information. And I'll show you that in a second. So we work very sophisticated equipment in the field. So this here is made by taking a pan, like a Rubbermaid container. And instead of putting brownies in it, you put cement. And you stick three PVC pieces in it. And then you stick your coral on it. And then you can move your corals around. And so we did transplant experiments. So there's one here, there's one there, there's one there. Everybody see them? Mm -hmm. I had a lot of them scattered in San Blas. The Kuna Indians loved them because they thought they were very good anchors or to hang their clothes on. So I did lose some of them. <laughs> but that's part of the job. And so what I found out was, uh, first of all, these guys were very happy. And they actually grow on these PVC pipes. So they're, they, they really like it. And so I'm going to show you the last picture of a gel. Now, this is very, whoa. But I think you can see, so if you look at co the first colony, can you tell that it's all the same? Can you uh -huh. see that? Great. If you look at the second colony, it's all the same as well. But it's different from the first colony. But within the second colony, it's all the same. If you look at the third colony, although it's harder to see, it's all the same. And so what this is, is this is the same colony that was sampled in 1989, 1996, and 1998. This colony was sampled 89, 91, 94, 96, and 98. And it shows you that the same individual symbiont remained in that colony. There was no change whatsoever over a decade. So we're not even talking about at a higher level. We're talking at the individual genotype state within it. So let me ask you this. Do you know anyone that has been divorced? Really? Hold on. <laughs> Why did they get divorced? Money. <laughs> if they remarried or found another partner, did they find one? Okay. And why That's did right. they find one? So go ahead and talk to the people next to you, and then we'll record the answers. Okay. <laughs> Now again, you don't have to answer for yourself, you can answer for somebody else, or somebody that you know. Why do people get divorced? 
A change of symbiont? Okay, so why do people get now, now you're jumping ahead though, because you're saying why potentially they want to get another partner. But why do people get divorced? They, they can't get along. Money. Sex. Money. Less sex. Less, less sex. arguing. Less arguing. Okay, less arguing. Okay, so if, if it doesn't work, why do they do it again? Okay, buttons for punishment because they can't live without a partner. Okay? They want to be happy. They want to be happy. So in spite of the fact that there was a bad experience or it didn't work out or they can't live with each other anymore, they still try it again. And the reason I ask you this is because um, basically the question is, do corals get divorced? And this is a question that has occupied scientists for the last 20 years, including I had a discussion in a, it's not, a, it's an a article discussion in a, in a journal. When, and basically there are two camps. There are camps that say corals can get divorced, and there are camps that say the corals cannot get divorced. So the, the question is, what if in changing conditions, hosts could switch symbiotic partners? And this exchange and data collection and discussion has gone on for the last 20 years. Um, and, it's, it, and then from there, the popular press is, pr is picking it up. So, for example, the New York Times in 2004 had an article that said, as the seas warm, algae helps some coral stand up to the heat. Because the idea is very, uh, is very optimistic. What if corals, because of global climate change, weren't doing well, but that's okay. Because what they'll do is they'll get rid of their algae, they'll bring in new algae, and everything will be fine. But the thing is, it probably is not going to work that way. So you have, so for example, if you look at temperature, with temperature, if you have increased temperature, increased temperature may negatively affect the host. So remember I had said, so you have three levels here. If you just look at the coral and the symbiont, you have the host, you have the algae, and you have the combination. Well, if, it, if the host is stressed by the increased temperature, it may cause the host to die. You also have the symbiont. If you have increase in temperature, that may make the symbiont unhappy. And two things may happen. The symbiont may leave the host, or the symbiont may die. In either case, if the symbiont leaves the host or the symbiont dies, that results in coral bleaching. What's coral bleaching? Or have you seen coral bleaching? Let me put it that way. Do you know what you're looking at? Well, it, it will eventually lead to dead coral, but at first it's live coral. When you first start to bleach, oh, and then if and then if both of them are unhappy, that will lead to both of them potentially um, falling apart. And the other thing is, the problem is, if the host is unhappy and the algae are fine, but the algae are within the host, then the host combi symbiont combination may be unhappy. If the symbiont is unhappy but the host is fine, it's again like you and your partner needing to pay rent. If one of you is unhappy, the other one has to carry the burden, it may bring both of you down and you may have to leave where you're living. So bleaching initially is the coral is alive. I don't know if you can see, but can you see these, these tentacles? And the reason it's called bleaching is because the algae are gone. Now we still do not know if the algae leave or if the algae are booted out. Okay? There are evidence that sometimes the algae that are expelled from the coral are dead. There are other corals where the algae that are expelled from the coral are alive. So we don't know if the algae are abandoning ship or they're being kicked out. But the bottom line is there's less algae. Since most polyps are clear and there's less algae, you do not have that brown color. What you end up with is a clear translucent polyp. What you are looking at is its exoskeleton. Now eventually, if the, now several things can happen. When a bleaching event happens, you usually have trace amounts of the symbionts. It's not like everybody's out. So if the coral can recover and the algae can grow back, then the coral will survive. If the coral, if the algae are toast and the coral cannot recover, that will lead to host death. When it leads to host death, the living tissue will be gone and you will see a white skeleton that is just a skeleton, and over time it will be covered by algae, and then it will be brown and, and so forth, and it will be a dead coral. So the, 
That is what happens during the bleaching process. Now, uh, my research, and so some of it I showed you, where you saw the exact same symbiont remained in the coral over time, seems to demonstrate that corals probably cannot get a divorce. And they're stuck with what they have. And so they're stuck with what they have once they get it. So the roommate that your parents put you in the room when you were two years old, that's your roommate for life. And you probably cannot get rid of it. Yes? Uh, what it, I assume it's different for different uh, types of coral, but what is the time period that uh, the coral can continue to remain alive without the zooxanthellae? Uh, my students hate me when I say this, but my, my answer usually is it depends. <laughs> and the reason it depends is when you have a stress event, how quickly they bounce back, if they bounce back, depends on, for example, how long that stress event is. So if you have a short two days where there's calm and the temperatures are high, it may cause bleaching, but if the temperatures drop down, they'll recuperate. If the temperatures continue for a whole week, it may be too much for some species. If on top of that you had rain and the rain, the sedimentation came down, and that. If on top of that you had um, a boat that dumped all the wastewater in that area, you have that. And so it really depends on the condition, the external conditions. And some corals do not bounce back. Some corals are hardier from the get-go. They can survive in spite of what is going on. And so it appears that what will happen is if, if conditions continue, global climate change continues, we may see a reduction in, a, in, a, in the species diversity because some species are hardier than others. Uh, but some of it may be a little too late. But you're talking days or weeks rather it, than Well, it, it depends on, oh, and then the other thing is, um, in, in the it depends category, it, so for example, researchers have found out if corals, if there was a bleaching event, those that survived the bleaching event, if there's another, ble if there's another like elevated temperatures, those that survive do not seem to bleach as much. So it's a selection process. Are Elkhorn considered the fragile? Elkhorn are, um, they've been hit with a double whammy because they've been also hit with disease. And so there are a lot of diseases that have, I haven't seen a lot of disease here, which is good. There's, there's a whole bunch of them and uh, white band disease, black band disease, and you know, yellow band disease. Um, and so those also attack. So then it's, it's a double, and then you have storms on top of that. And so if a coral is stressed to begin with, and then it gets broken up into pieces, and then those pieces get tumbled, and it has very few symbionts, it may not, not um, survive. So it is considered a more fragile coral? Well, it, it I mean, it used to dominate the Caribbean, yeah. and now there, you know, there are very, very few spots. And so right now, I mean, it's almost to the point where it's considered an endangered species. I mean, it, it's actually, it's, it is, in, it, it's crossing that line. And so scientists are trying to figure out what is going on. They're trying to reseed the reef. They're trying to generate all these, and trying to understand the genetics of the coral. Um, and so it's, it's hard. I mean, sometimes when you go to a reef and you see a lot of corals, for example, I showed you the, the island, the Kuna Nation, where I was at. There was one reef where there were, it was covered with this coral that I worked on, Plexora Kuna. I mean, it was full of them. But when you did the genetics of the coral, the host, there were only three genotypes, okay? There were three individuals that propagated that reef and through asexual reproduction, through breaking and attaching, they made more of themselves. But that means there are only three <coughs> genotypes there. So if there was a disease that hit them, there would be only three genotypes. Maybe two would survive, maybe all would survive or not. So, but yeah, I mean, the condition of elkhorn coral is not a good condition right now. There was a question in the back, yeah, yes? We have a unique system situation on Cebu. Uh, I've been here for three years and suddenly the beach has re returned in Wells Bay because we had a storm and apparently it shut the, the nature itself is also decimating all of this. So well, right. I mean what are we I mean what is the difference? I mean is nature more destructive or are we more destructive? So the answer to that is corals, so I showed you the three levels of selection, right? That there could be selection on the host, on the symbiont, and on the combination. But the, the problem is corals, all, all organisms can change over time. The problem that we're dealing with right now is that the change is too rapid 
for the corals to keep up with. But is the re reproductive well, system more natural than dealing with nature, or is man really messing it up? Man is messing it up. And the problem is that um, there's also a critical size. So if you have elkhorn coral, even though you may see two elkhorn coral, that may be too little to reproduce. So if one elkhorn coral releases sperm and egg, what are the chances that they'll meet in the ocean, right? Versus a whole field of them. And so there's this critical drop of, of potentially of, of what, and that's where there's these things called uh, marine protected areas. And people spend a lot of time discussing what is better, having one big marine protected area or having small ones that so you can have, you know, downstream, the larvae, the eggs and sperm will carry and be fertilized downstream. So you would agree with the fact that let nature take its course and say that it's unique in regards to we, well, have, a, we have a system that's here that's protecting the marine shark. The protection is great and that helps. Um, but there are some things that you cannot control, which is the seawater temperature. Uh, but every, I mean, but, but every little bit helps. I mean, we shouldn't just throw in the towel because all of us wouldn't be able to snorkel and dive here, what's or have a livelihood for those that have a livelihood. Okay, so, what's, what's your what's your take on sailing? Um, well, I would like to know what the adults find out in the survey tomorrow, okay. um, and see what what proportion of the of the coverage is coral and what proportion yeah. is soft and hard coral. So, um, so this is bleaching. And then I want to end with one other example. You may have seen Queen Conch. Mm -hmm. And Queen Conch, so this is the shell, and these wee little things are the eyes on the eye stalks. So the organism is underneath. Queen Conch actually have a symbiosis with the same algae. They're symbiodinium. And these algae, so if you look at a Queen Conch, if you kind of dissect it out, there's the whole animal underneath. Well, again, my colleague in Mexico that I'm working with, Dr. Vanasek, found out so people are trying to cult to aquaculture queen conch because the, the, in the wild they've been overfished in many, many places. And so they found, so she's found out in an article that has just been, um, that has, is just coming out, that the survival rate of the juveniles of queen conch is significantly increased when they have the symbionts within them. So for aquaculture that is really important because you would want to introduce the symbionts in order to have them succeed. Now then we, we did a collaboration where we looked at the adults and the adults, this whole animal is underneath and so the algae do not, the light that comes through the shell is very, very minimal. It's not enough to do photosynthesis and so the article, I mean I literally today got the email from her saying that the article has been accepted to the Journal of Experimental Marine Biology and Ecology. Well we show that in the adult queen conch it appears that the algae may be parasitic because they're switching from doing photosynthesis to doing heterotrophy where they feed off what the animal is producing. So this kind of ties in, you guys are going to have a, a conch expert, although I don't think they'll talk about symbiosis, so I'm, I'm throwing that in here. Um, but so just to sum things up, when we look at symbiosis, it is a spectrum. You can't really put things in boxes. And the answer, which my students hate, which is it depends, it depends on the environmental conditions where things are, and it also depends potentially on life stages. So for example, with the queen conch, in the juvenile stage, it is advantageous to have the symbionts. The problem is, or at least for the queen conch, the problem is, once it acquires the symbionts, it seems like it cannot get rid of them. And then something that was mutualistic at one life stage and is really important for survival then becomes a potentially a parasitic situation that the host tolerates, okay? Because obviously they're alive, so they can tolerate it, but it's, there's a cost to having these symbionts because they're not photosynthesizing, so they're not contributing, and yet they're alive and they're dividing. In regards to corals, we said the corals have a mutualism, an obligate mutualism with an endosymbiont single-celled algae, and this has been regarded as a mutualism and as an obligate mutualism. Well, we may get a situation where, the, the, depending on the environmental conditions, this may be taxing to the host or to the symbiont or to the host-symbiont combination, and this may actually move from a mutualistic situation to potentially a commensalistic situation, or potentially even to this side of the spectrum, and it may fall apart because you have a roommate as long as it works for you. When you can afford it and it's not working for you, you live alone, right? And 
you go back into having a roommate when it works for you. And so these conditions depend on the environment, depend on your financial status, depends on your emotional status, and depends what the other partner brings to the relationship, because you're going to change that idea depending on what they're contributing as well. So basically, um, we don't know where this is going. And we don't know how the environment that, that we're affecting is going to affect the direction of this relationship and whether it will survive. Because if it, if it shifts from mutualism, it's going to potentially uncouple or one of the, organis one of the uh, in organisms involved is going to die and then the other one may die as well if it, doesn't, if it cannot survive without its partner. Okay? Um, and then I just put in an acknowledgement slide because you can't do this in a void. So your, your statement is very well taken about symbiosis. is nothing in this universe exists alone. And so I do have undergraduates that work in my lab. I have graduate students that work in my lab. And um, thankfully, funding agencies, which are back online right now, because the government <coughs> in the US is back from that. Um, yes. so, um, so those are the people that were involved in various projects that I told you about. So thank you very much. <laughs> outside the world? So that's an excellent question. For the longest time, people were like, where are these guys on the reef? Because obviously the larvae are getting them. Where are they getting them from? So one answer is parrot poop. So somebody did a study where uh, a while back where they uh, uh, analyzed the gut content of parrot fish yeah. and the, the poop of parrot fish. And the symbiodinium are alive. So they go through the digestive system and they're alive. Uh, they are potentially found in sediments. Right. So there have been molecular, people have done molecular studies where they have found something that falls into the same group as symbiodinium, but they haven't gone as far as seeing whether they can go into symbiosis, okay? There are other dinoflagellates that don't go into symbiosis, but they're found in the sand. The other thing is there are some animals, um, including corals and sea anemones, that purge symbionts occasionally, and they're alive. And that's one way to control their numbers, because there, it's a fine balance. Now, for example, one thing I didn't talk about, in areas where, so we talk about blue water, right? In areas where you have sewage discharge, and you have the waters are nutrient rich, the algae can grow, the algae now have more nutrients, and they can grow faster than the corals can maintain their densities. They actually can outgrow their host. It's like your friend asking if, if, it, if you don't mind if they bring in a friend and then all of a sudden you turn around there are five people in your living room and you can't get rid of them. And so there is the, the corals and sea anemones can occasionally purge to maintain. I mean, you don't want too many symbionts. That's harmful. And so there's a fine balance. And the host can maintain the number of symbionts that it can maintain. But when you have external forces like extra nutrients, it shifts the balance, and the algae are going, woohoo! You know, they're, they're, you're growing and multiplying and dividing, and the corals can die as a result of that. So it's, but but uh, but corals purge them, parrotfish poop them, and so they are they are found in the environment. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I found that the um, bargiacs. I'm talking about fish now. Mm -hmm. but, um, it's very particular. These bargiacs sometimes they uh, get in a weird relationship with different types of fishes. I've seen barjack with, for example, the stingrays, mm -hmm. but I also seen barjack with uh, uh, trumpet fish. So, what makes a barjack leave the group, the school, to go with one trumpet fish or with one stingray? This is something I've always been wondering. I don't know. What well, the, we don't. I don't think we give them enough credit to how smart they are. And so, you may notice there are a lot of these odd combinations on the reef where a fish will follow an eel or will follow something else that will basically scare organisms out, flush them out of the reef, and then they benefit because they eat them as well. And so they have figured out that if you follow the eel, you're going to get rewarded. So this individual is, you're telling me this individual is smarter than the other I don't know if it's one. smarter, but it, they, and you don't know necessarily, it may take turns. I mean, you don't, because there's a risk involved in going away from the group. So whenever you have an association, you have to have, there's a, a cost benefit to anything, right? There's a benefit to having a roommate, there's a cost to having a roommate. If a schooling fish, 
decides to leave the group, there's a cost to that because they're 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 separate, and now they you know there's a benefit to being in a in a in a in a school, and so there may be benefits that outweigh the risks of that. It may be the fittest individual that can swim fast. You know, yeah. we, unless you tag them and you follow them, you don't know which one is, is the one that's choosing, choosing to go. Um, but there are a lot of relationships where you, where you see that they will, the two organisms will follow each other. They don't have to be two fish. Um, there, are, uh, there are situations, there are blind shrimp that dig burrows. And then there are gobies that live in those burrows, and they follow the. They, then the shrimp kind of tethers himself to this goby, and when the goby recedes, the fish goes with it, or the shrimp goes with it. So you have a lot of relationships on the reef that are built on on, on um, mutual benefit. I also realized that some of those um, individuals they also change. They look a little bit darker. I don't know if you have ever seen that. On the world. I have not. Um, yes. That sounds cool. Yeah, so I'll those parts they okay. get a little bit darker. I don't know if this is a. Uh, I don't know. Trans flash or something that maybe will show. But I've seen that a few times. Okay. Well, I mean, the, the, but those kind of observations are really, really cool because that's. I mean, every single research idea starts from an observation, and sometimes the you know, the people that are diving a lot, the people that are snorkeling a lot, those are the people that notice things. I mean, one of the disadvantages of living in Midland, you know, or anywhere in the U.S. and traveling to the reef, unless you live in, on the reef and you stick your head in the water every day, every other day, you miss things. And it's and you know, fishermen are a wealth of information. And people that live in an area are a wealth of information for what is is happening, or what is unusual, or what is, you know, just paying attention is really, really important. And then you can go and you can ask the questions and, and try to get the answers for it. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm completely oblivious to any science or anything. But what does NASA have to do with? Uh, it's one of your funders. What uh -huh. does that have to do with symbiosis? Uh, so they about um, there's life outer space. No, um, and we didn't we didn't go to space for it. They funded a project that looked at uh, uh, they were we were using GIS. So GIS is uh, some people are nodding their heads. Um, it's it's a, a spatial program, and we were looking. <laughs> and we were looking at seagrass beds, and we were working on uh, uh, the pattern of the seagrass beds using this spatial program to analyze it. And I also used the spatial program, the GIS program, to map out. I didn't talk about it at all, but I did a survey of Gorgonian corals throughout the world yeah. and found what symbionts they have with, within them. You know, it's one of those tough jobs that makes you go to the Galapagos and the Red Sea. And, uh, and so I use the GIS. Somebody has to do it, right? Somebody has to do it. So I use the GIS software to lay layers to see if there were patterns to distributions. And then I generated a map. And there are patterns. And I also use the GIS software. So one of the things that I didn't tell you is that most corals, not only do they not, not divorce their symbionts, they have one symbiont group within them. And they don't seem to change that symbiont group. There are only 75% of corals have one symbiont group within them, while 25% have two. So they have like clades A and D. And so initially people thought that they can acquire that from the environment, but now we know that the larvae get, or the first polyp, gets both A and D, and then they play with the proportion of what they have. But those are very few corals. Only 25% of species can do that. And that was uh, that came out the same uh, week that uh, um, it was written up in, in New Scientist and in, in, in Science because of the fact that look, people corals may not be able to change what they have, and we then need to realize what they can tolerate and what they can't, and how far we can push them. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Let's give a big thanks to Dr. Kevin for that. Seba Conservation Foundation for providing their boat, and Sea Seba for providing their boats. Uh, obviously, the program that we laid out is working because these kids are interested and they're engaged. It was great to see today. Awesome. So, what's coming up?